Welcome to Morning in America, Lecture 30. In this lecture, we'll pick up the story of America's decline throughout the 70s, lack of confidence and trust in the government, but then how a B-movie actor came along and brought hope back to the United States. Get ready for the story of Ronald Reagan. But first, Jimmy Carter. After Gerald Ford comes a Southerner who promised Americans he'd be an outsider. And he was an outsider, a peanut farmer from Georgia. Um, comes into the presidency, hoping to regain Americans' trust and show that they once again can look to their president as an honest and capable leader. He does achieve some very notable and important uh, moves in his presidency. For example, the Camp David Accords of 1978 brokered a peace deal between Israel and Egypt to end 30 years of conflict. This is a significant move because Egypt recognizes Israel's right to exist um, as a result of these accords. So it's quite important um, as a foreign policy but sadly for Jimmy Carter, he gets caught up in an energy crisis. For Americans who'd always been used to never running out of things, we have all the resources we want, all the materials we need, our environment will always give us everything. It came as quite a shock in the 70s to realize that the environment can't give forever, and there are certain things that Americans can't just expect. This energy crisis led to Carter calling for Americans to learn to sacrifice. Instead of using energy, they needed to voluntarily give up um, energy, put on a thicker sweater, as Carter did, or put solar panels on the White House, as Carter did. Carter called for the moral equivalent of war against this high energy usage, Americans. You needed to meow your way to better energy consumption. Foreign policy wise, Carter is president when the Soviets invade Afghanistan in 1979. And um, although this does not uh, bring him down in particular, it eventually will set the stage for the decline of the Soviets. Afghanistan is their Vietnam. The US though does have a foreign policy component here in that we use the CIA to train Afghan rebels. So we're providing them with the training they needed so that they can fight communism. And of course, uh, that will create problems for us later. The big move of Carter's presidency that ultimately results in his downfall will be the Iranian hostage crisis. It's a crisis we essentially created because in 1954, we'd overthrown uh, through a CIA operation, the government of Iran. There's a pro-American government and that pro-American government um, lasts until 1979. When Iranian rebels, mostly uh, young students, overthrow this US-backed leader, and in the process, they kidnap 53 Americans. So this hostage crisis throws the Carter presidency into a national nightmare for diplomacy. How can we rescue these kidnapped Americans trapped in a country that is hostile to the US? Well, there is a rescue attempt. It's pretty horrific. But on the domestic front, the lack of Iranian oil leads to 149% gas increase um, in prices. That combined with some moves that the Carter administration had made um, meant that Americans were pretty suffering, suffering pretty deeply, not just in foreign policy, 
but every time they put gas in their cars. So Carter's popularity will plummet. Lowest approval rating that he achieved was 28% um, in his this term of office. So this outsider who promised to restore America's faith ends up being the victim of a debacle across the waters, as well as an economic problem that makes Americans miserable here. I love the fact that Carter has this very interesting peanut statue to him in Georgia. Um, it's <laughs> quite something to behold. Uh, so if you ever are visiting down in Georgia, you might want to take a trip to see this. Um, nod to him as the peanut farmer he was. Carter was a very, very devout Christian, taught Sunday school, still teaches Sunday school, um, even though he's quite advanced in years. Um, so this cartoonist thought he would employ a bit, old, bibble, bit of a bit old biblical model. Uh, let me try that again. This cartoonist thought he would employ a bit of a biblical idea how's that, um, to mock Carter's energy programs. Carter is essentially what biblical figure? That's right, Noah. And no one wants to build the ark. Americans are like, talk to the hand, because the face don't understand. Wrestling with high gas prices and fuel consumption was Carter's Part of Carter's own making uh, when there were deregulations of the oil and gas industry, but the Iranian hostage crisis interrupted the supply of oil, and that wasn't something Carter, you know, necessarily could have fixed. The crisis itself caused Americans to distrust, you know, the power and the might of the United States. Um, you know, who are we that we can be you know, challenged so visibly by a group of Iranian students? Um, and of course, people want their families and their loved ones who are held hostage to be brought back home. So in the election of 1980, Carter does not do well. Carter only gets 41% of the popular vote. Bad economy, bad things going on foreign policy, and he's opposed by a conservative Republican with a winning smile and personality and the ability to deliver a line almost like he had studied acting. Yep, that's right, Ronald Reagan, um, the anti-communist actor from the 50s, who uh, went on to be a uh, governor in California and a beloved icon of the conservative movement. Reagan's domestic policies have been termed Reaganomics. Um, one critic called them voodoo economics. These are, in economic terms, known as supply side or trickle down theories. Um, it is now regarded um, by recent research as being intellectually just dumb. It makes no sense and it doesn't work. But at the time, it was a theoretical idea that people said, oh, yes, this makes sense. We should do it. The, the thinking behind it is if the government cuts regulations and cuts taxes on businesses, those businesses will have more money. They will hire people, more jobs, better economy. So Reagan presides over a massive tax overhaul that leads to extensive tax cuts for the wealthy. By the uh, end of this period, the top 1% will own 37% of the wealth. So if you imagine this is a pie, 37% of that pie goes to 1% of the people. Um, this massive tax cut and deregulation program um, does stimulate some economic growth, but it stimulates it only for people who are already doing well. So removing government rules on companies as well as tax cuts 
does in fact give some money and put money into the pockets of people, but those are people who already had money in their pockets. Reagan, at the same time as doing all of this, cuts welfare and entitlement spending. So tightening up um, that system that was instituted under LBJ, the Great Society, because those people don't deserve it, they're lazy, they don't deserve benefits, they should just learn to work hard. Um, we're gonna see, scholars are gonna call this essentially a great wealth transfer um, as the richest Americans will get richer and the poorest Americans will get poorer. Reagan will also um, be noted and remembered as an anti-union president. Um, even though he'd been part of a union in his earlier days, um, his stance against um, unions trying to advocate for better wages um, is part of the general decrease in union membership at this time period, as uh, lots of workers are seeing their jobs being lost anyway, thanks to deindustrialization, but then also seeing that the, the president and the federal government does not back you um, will lead to some demoralization, some feeling like, why bother? This is, this is not gonna help. Um, most famously, Reagan's stance against unions has to do with the air traffic controller strike. Uh, for which he threatened to fire all of them if they didn't get back to work. Reagan takes advantage, full advantage, of a very specific group of conservatives known as the religious right or the moral majority. These are conservative people who are deeply evangelical or fundamentalist Christians, and instead of hiding from politics, are fully invested in politics. And Reagan quickly learns to speak their language and align himself to their needs and their wants um, because they can throw voters his way. Even though Reagan himself probably had no real Christian values of his own, um, for him, church going was mostly just an exercise and doing what people expected you to do. Um, the moral majority and religious right um, really called for Christian values to dominate public policy. So there should be, for example, no abortion because that would violate their Christian sense of ethics and values. The leader of the moral majority, Reverend Jerry Falwell, is pictured here with this lovely choir of moral majority men and women, uh, well-dressed. Um, clearly, these women have uh, harkened back to their grandmas in these outfits uh, from floor to ceiling. Ain't gonna see no flapper outfits here. And of course, linking their uh, Christian values to the American flag in the background. So it's as if Christianity and America in their minds are one and the same. The 80s saw the uh, description of the wealthy business-oriented people of the age as the yuppie, the young urban professional with his lovely pinstripe suit, um, the gourmet shopping bag that contains fresh pasta, um, suit by Ralph Lauren, you've got your Sony Walkman, um, Gucci briefcase, um, because you are a man about town, a woman about town, on the go, attractive and wealthy, thanks to those Reagan tax cuts. What we can actually see between 1980 and 1990 is how those tax cuts shift wealth from the poorest of Americans to the wealthiest of Americans, or it's called the Great Wealth Transfer. In that time period, poorest Americans will see their share of American wealth drop um, about 10%, almost 10%, while the richest Americans will rise 15.6%. Reagan um, was criticized by her block and other folks as saying 
um, that he did not support welfare, did not support big government, but in fact, many of his programs amounted to welfare for the wealthy. And that has been a criticism that you will hear repeated again and again. Tax cuts for certain groups of people can be thought of as a kind of welfare, a government benefit or an entitlement. So what's the difference between that and say uh, passing out an entitlement for someone who's on the poorer end of things? In this other cartoon, Reagan is portrayed as an Ebenezer Scrooge ignoring the needs of the urban poor. The 1980s is also famously the age of big business um, doing lots of shady things. You can find no end to 1980s movies, usually starring Michael J. Fox, um, Bette Midler, for example, stars in one, where there's always some corporation doing something terrible and this plucky young person at the end comes in and saves the day and rescues and brings heart and soul back to the corporation. My favorite example of this, of a corporate world that just crushes its workers' hopes and dreams until the workers fight back, is Dolly Parton in 9 to 5, so I encourage you to watch it. By the end of the time period, one of the people who lived in this big business world and exploited the Reagan uh, era was this man pictured here um, on the cover of Time. This is Michael Milken, who built an empire on junk bonds, um, risky bond investments um, that essentially netted him quite a bit of wealth, but it was all a house of cards. Reagan is famously known for being a strong military-minded president. Um, and we can see that the national debt will rise 189% under his presidency. He loves the military. All about strength. It's the projection of strength. One of the reasons for this increase is the uh, Strategic Defense Initiative, nicknamed famously Star Wars. SDI was a Cold War program that aimed to create lasers in space which would shoot down incoming Soviet missiles. This would be a system of satellites with mirrors and layers, lasers. The Soviets would fire and Americans could go punch a button and the space laser would take care of the Soviets and we would win, yay. It's technologically impossible, but the US defense uh, system continued to pour money into it Lots and 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 lots of money into it because we've got to make it look like we are doing something. We got to keep trying. We got to keep investing because we've got to keep the Soviets on their toes. So in many ways, I think of Reagan as almost like the Eisenhower era part two. It's like the 1950s part two. But economically, Reagan is like the 1920s part two. The cost of SDI was $70 billion. Ba ba billion dollars. And didn't work. This warlike stance put a lot of pressure on the Soviets to keep up. Um, and some scholars have tried to argue that, in fact, this hastened the end of the Soviet Union. A recent scholar has pushed back on this narrative and said, no, Reagan didn't have anything to do with it, and we should stop crediting Reagan. Um, instead, we should look at the Soviets' own internal politics, um, the reforms known as Glasnost and Perestroika to reform communism, um, started under Mikhail Gorbachev, and that we should look at the weaknesses in the Soviet economy the Soviet participation in Afghanistan, there Vietnam, as the primary factors hastening the downfall of the Soviet Union. Um, by 1989, the Soviet Union will collapse and the Cold War itself will be over in 91. So America wins, capitalism, we win. The Reds are dead.
Reagan's love for defense is uh, mocked in this cartoon um, while he ignores the cities or social security or in the environment. My favorite quote about him from the environment is, trees cause more pollution than people do. Think about that one. This is SDI, the lasers in space. Um, lots and lots of spending in the US military uh, a lot of it wasteful. I could tell you some stories about $600 toilet lids um, and $35 hammers and all kinds of extravagant waste of money. They had plenty of money and people were told, spend it. No matter what you had to do, spend it. There is another shift in the Cold War, though, that has to do with Latin America and South America. Reagan presides over something known as the Reagan Doctrine, which is essentially the Eisenhower Doctrine and the Truman Doctrine, but just in Latin and South America. Um, and it's really nothing new. That is, the U.S. is going to contain communism south of our border. So, same thing, different day. Um, the invasion of Grenada in 1981 is an illustration of this, where the U.S. sent Marines to a Caribbean island with no strategic importance to topple a regime that looked like it was going to become an ally of the Soviets. I will say, freaking fantastic operation name, Urgent Fury. Really good operation name for this one. Um, and the idea, of course, is we're going to save these poor people from a, a life under the Soviets that would be awful um, and indefensible. This actually caused a lot of problems with England um, that Reagan had to smooth over um, as a result of this little invasion. The most famous of the um, Reagan doctrine in instances would be Nicaragua. Um, and the Iran-Contra scandal that followed out of it. Um, Reagan supported the Contras, uh, which were a group of guerrilla force folks in Nicaragua trying to fight the commies of Nicaragua. So we're once again opposing communists. Um, Reagan tried to frame the Contras as freedom fighters. Um, they are out there, you know, just doing the work of the Lord opposing those commies. The truth is they were actually horrific people. CIA trained, um, they murdered journalists, they raped women, they smuggled cocaine. They were legit horrible human beings, but they were getting backed by the United States. And of course they weren't communists, so we have to love them. The Reagan um, administration was actually forbidden to supply them with resources. So Reagan found a secret way to do that through Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. North figured out rather than sending money and resources to the Contras, he could sell missiles to Iran because Iran loves America. They just absolutely adore the United States, right? And um, of course that would help them in their current ongoing war with Iraq. And then the profits from that could be back channel sent to the Contras. It's still illegal. It's a violation of the Boland Amendment. No matter how the money gets there, it violates congressional law. When all of this was uncovered, Reagan simply developed amnesia. Well, I, I can't shed any light on what's going on. I, I don't have any knowledge of these things. And his performance, um, if it may be termed that, essentially earned him um, a free pass. He got to be nicknamed the Teflon president because no criticism seemed to stick to him. Um, he did go on national TV, and this is what he said. It just still boggles the mind to this day. In, in my heart, we, we Americans did not do these things, but the facts and the evidence say that we do. 
So I, I suppose we, we actually did them. There's my best Reagan impression that I can pull off. So essentially he's saying, the, he's saying I don't believe we did this, uh, but we have all this mounting evidence that in fact the United States broke the law and, and Reagan is able to end his presidency without much um, scandal uh, tarnishing him, uh, but some of that scandal will follow others. Lots of cartoonists had a field day, Herblock portraying Reagan as um, doing one thing on TV, but something else in the background. Um, remember, Iran is not a country friendly to the United States because of the Iranian Revolution and their hatred of U the US. They call us the great Satan. So that becomes the burden that Reagan has to carry. Also becomes the tattoo or one of the tattoos on Reagan's um, history on his body. Um, so you can see the Iranian tattoo reference there, the Iran-Contra uh, scandal there. And uh, Herblock also uh, made fun of another aspect of Reagan's denial of what was going on when the most common way to say that we did this without saying we did it was to say mistakes were made. Because if you say mistakes were made, it's passive voice. There's no subject there. Who made the mistakes? Well, I don't know. They just were made. Mm, don't know. Reagan, despite everybody knowing that this was clearly an act of dishonesty and deceit and knowing that he was lying, um, it does not really tarnish his, uh, his, his memory um, over time. He becomes one of the most popular conservative icons, and today he still very much is a conservative icon, um, he, despite what people know about uh, this this uh, Iran-Contra scandal, as well as some of the other shadier things he did, like ignoring the AIDS crisis, for example, pretty much saying, who cares? Those are a bunch of gay men, they deserve to die. So it doesn't really affect him in the end. Um, did he bring mourning back to America? At least on television, he certainly looked like he was doing that. But I think as we get further out, we will see more assessments of the Reagan presidency that will cause us to question a lot of what happened.